Hello ladies and gentlemen. Today unfortunately a vast majority of single Christians who are seeking to be married are confused or unaware that God has the perfect person for them and those who are already married might not be aware that God has certain principles for a godly perfect marriage relationship. So if you're already married this message will help you strengthen your relationship with your spouse and live and have a godly relationship that God has meant you to have. I've made a series of sermons on marriage according to the scriptures, one of which you're about to watch. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Open our minds, our hearts, give me wisdom to speak your truth, to speak your words and teach from the scriptures what a marriage should be like from the scripture according to your eyes, according to your words and bring messages that are relevant to the lives of people who are watching. Open the eyes and ears of those who are listening and watching these sermons and videos and bless them with the perfect marriage relationship if they're already married. Strengthen their marriage relationship and bring life to that marriage that is dying. Strengthen that marriage that is weakened and bring Holy Spirit in their lives and let the Holy Spirit guide them and lead them through the scriptures. And I'm also praying for those who are single and seeking for a godly person to be married to and have a godly relationship with that you may give them wisdom and open their eyes to the principles that you have for them for their future life and for their future spouse open their eyes to see the right perfect person for them according to you and according to your word not according to their own criteria. In Jesus' name, may God bless you with these messages. Amen and amen. Today's message is about marriage according to the scriptures. If you're already married, then this message will help you strengthen your relationship with your spouse and get all the benefits and promises of God in your married relationship. If you're single and seeking to get married, then this message will help you find God's best person for you. Marriage is a sacred covenant between a man and a woman in the sight of God and certainly not something to be taken lightly. Marriage has been mentioned in the Bible numerous times in numerous occasions but in this message uh, I'm focusing on the sanctity of marriage between a man and a woman. Now, before I start anything, I need to stress that marriage, according to the scriptures and in the eyes of God, is between a man and a woman and nothing else in between. Although the spirit of Antichrist has been for decades trying to normalize the thought of same-sex marriage in the minds of people, but according to the scriptures, and according to God's word, this is called fornication and it's a detestable act in the sight of God. Leviticus chapter 20 verse 13 reads, If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. The world might consider any types of relationship just as good as marriage. And in fact, if you look at the laws that have been uh, legislated just recently in the last few years or decades, we see that same-sex couples, partners living together, have the same rights as legally and lawfully married couples who are married in the sight of God 
and the marriages between man and a woman. But as far as God is concerned, a marriage is only between a man and a woman. We've got now to the point that people are so confused, they don't understand and they can't distinguish the difference between love and lust. This is the acts of Satan, not people's confusion on their own. With these things going on, it is quite foreseeable that people will soon consider their relationship, their illegal, illegitimate and detestable relationships with their animals, with their pets, as marriage. And it is again foreseeable that people will be taken to streets to claim their rights to be married to their pets, probably in the church too. It's sad we're heading that way. The world is heading that way. We are in this world, but we are not of the world, Jesus says. However, these types of behavior, these detestable acts, they're nothing new. As, as they want us to think, these are the results and products of new age, new century. No, these have been there for centuries. If you go back to the scriptures, you'll see. If the Bible is not clear about a few things, it is certainly crystal clear on these issues. Sexual immorality, adultery, lust, fornication and bestiality. Exodus chapter 20 verse 14 reads, You shall not commit adultery. Now this is one of the Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses. Matthew 5 verse 28 reads, this is Jesus talking, but I tell you that everyone who gazes at a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. He is referring to adultery and, he, and the laws that were given through Moses to people, to Israelites. And he is saying adultery is not just committing it, actually the act. But if you look at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery in your heart. The same applies to a woman. If a woman looks at a man lustfully, she has already committed adultery in her heart. This is to tell you how deep the laws of God go. And God sees your heart, not just your actions. Leviticus Chapter 20, verse 15 and 16 reads, If a man lies with an animal, he shall surely be put to death, and you shall kill the animal. If a woman approaches any animal and lies down with it, you shall kill the woman and the animal. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So that's dealing with bestiality. Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 21. Cursed is he who lies with any kind of animal. All the people shall say, Amen. Galatians chapter 5 verse 19. Now the deeds of the flesh are obvious which are adultery, sexual immorality, uncleanness, lustfulness. Now these were so obvious to them then, but the world has become so corrupt by Satan, so much that people are confused and this is not obvious to them anymore. Like I said, they don't distinguish the difference between love and lust or sex. They'll soon call any uh, sexual behavior as partnership and they would want their rights for that. So I'll read that again. Galatians chapter 5 verse 19. Now the deeds of the flesh are obvious, which are adultery, sexual immorality, 
uncleanness, lustfulness. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 3 reads, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality, not even a hint of sexual immorality, or of any kind of impurity, or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. We are holy people. Be holy, God says, because I am holy. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 8 reads, Let us not commit sexual immorality as some of them committed, and in one day 23,000 fell. 23,000 people fell because of their sexual immorality and perversion. So let us now be pure and holy, not commit sexual immorality. Now, Marriage of scripture is always mentioned as an unchangeable covenant, again, between a man and a woman. And it is to be kept holy, not only by the couple, but by all. So everybody has to honor a marriage between a man and a woman. So you see a married couple, you are supposed to honor that. You're not to lust after somebody else's wife or somebody else's husband. Let's read the scripture. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 reads, Marriage should be honored by all. Now, people just read past that without analyzing it and without realizing what that actually means. Marriage should be honored by all. And the marriage bed kept pure. I read that again. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. So, again, we read that here that marriage should be honored by all, not just the couple themselves, and the marriage bed should be kept pure because God judges the adulterer and the sexually immoral. So as we see, marriage is a sacred covenant between a man and a woman and is to be kept holy and sacred, not just by the couple themselves, but by all. On the other hand, sexual perversion and sexual immorality is a detestable sin in the sight of God. So they're not the same as some people are confused and they don't understand the difference. Sexual immorality in fact is one of the main reasons that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and many other cities. We read in Jude even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, having in the same way as these, given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are shown as an example, suffering the punishment of eternal fire. They've gone after strange flesh. Strange flesh is because when you're married, your spouse is bone of your bones and flesh of your flesh, like Adam said when God joined Eve um, with Adam, which we read later. And uh, the same way, when you're married, you are part of each other, you're one body. We talk about that in a minute. But when you go after another, that another is a strange flesh to you. Or if you're not married and you go after another, when God hasn't joined you together, that is strange flesh. Or if you're after sexual perversion and behavior with animals, then again, it's another strange flesh. All that. Now, if we go back to Genesis, we can see the the first account of marriage that God actually joined the first man and the first woman together. 
Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 reads, Yahweh God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Now God says it's not good for a man to be alone, so I'll make a perfect suitable helper for him. And what he does in almost every area of your life, not just marriage, God put that desire in your heart first, then with your prayers and your prophecy to that, he will meet that desire, he'll give you that desire. If you are right to begin with, if you are seeking God's uh, kingdom first, seek the kingdom of God first and all these things shall be added unto you. So first God puts the desire in your heart and with your prayer and your supplication, God will meet that desire. God will give you the desire of your heart. Not your own selfish desire, but the desire that God has put in your heart. Because God will deal with your selfish desires when you pray and seek God's kingdom, God's way, God's best, best thing for you in your life. Then God will take away anything that's impure and wrong in your heart and will put the desires that you should have and then when you pray you're basically prophesying in line with what God wants for you and he will meet those desires. Now this is what's happening here. God first puts the desire in Adam's heart by causing all the animals walking past Adam as he's naming them and all of them are passing by in pairs. So every animal that's passing by Adam, they're all going in pairs. But at the end, there is no suitable helper for Adam, he says. If you read Genesis chapter 2, verse 19 to 20, it says, Out of the ground Yahweh God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the sky, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called every living creature became his name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the sky and to every animal of the field. But for man there was not found a helper comparable to him. Couldn't find a helper for him. Now this when you read that, you don't see, but the, the fact is, when Adam sees all these animals in pairs, he realizes he's alone. And none of them are suitable for him. Just before that, he had no desire, Adam had no desire to have a helper. There was no need. But when he sees that every animal is in pairs, he feels there's something missing there. So what happened here is that God put that desire by just doing that parade of animals in front of him. He put that desire in his heart and then gives him that desire of his heart. How does he give him that desire? Genesis chapter 2 verse 21 to 25 it reads, Yahweh God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. Now this is total anesthetic today. As the man slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in his place. Yahweh God made a woman from the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man will leave his father and his mother and will join with his wife and they will be one flesh. Now, they will be one flesh. He will leave his father and his mother and join his wife and they will be one flesh. So ladies, you are father and mother for your husband. You have a big task. Nevertheless, when you join, you are one flesh. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, as we just read these scriptures, God 
does a surgical operation, takes Adam's rib and makes Eve out of it and presents her to him and they join. Now, they haven't joined yet, but man kind of proclaims it as proclaims his, his unity with the woman by saying, now, this is the flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh. Now, as we just read those passages of scripture, Adam has just undergone a surgery and he has found his perfect suitable helper. And what he says is amazing because he says, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. There is far more me meaning in this than what appears on the surface. Basically, he's proclaiming his unity with his wife, Eve. This is before any physical contact. So he already sees this is his perfect, suitable companion. And he calls her bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. And that is the unity because God says they are one in flesh. Now, although God doesn't need to do uh, a surgery on every man and every woman to get them married, but the process of marriage should be almost the same process. We should go all through the same process. First is the desire God puts in your heart, not man, not yourself, not the devil, but God has to put that desire in your heart. It has to be from God. And you have to make sure that it is actually from God. And then you have to pray earnestly and God will meet the desire of your heart by bringing the right person that is right for you as far as God can see. Now you might have your own list of criteria for your right person, but God's criteria for you might be totally different, might be more or less the same. We don't know. It all depends on God's perfect choice for you. Now, if God joined a man and a woman, I stress on if God, if God joined you together, um, because I don't want to have people taking my words as a license to sin. Now, if God joined a man and a woman, this is a sacred unity and it happens first in the spirit. As per Adam's account of marriage, as we just looked at it, there was no certificate of marriage, there was no piece of paper, there was no witnesses, witness was God. There was no uh, bells and do's and all that. It, it, it was very simple, first done in the spirit. And there was no physical contact first. And there was no love at first sight either. He just knew in the spirit, as soon as he saw Eve, that she is the bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. He'd already seen all the animals in pairs. The desire was born in his heart to have a helper and God gave him the desire of his heart and they were joined together in the spirit first. When Adam says, this is the flesh of my flesh and bone of my bones. The same process applies to us when God joins the man and the woman and only if God joins the man and the woman. And it's not the will of man or woman, but it's God's will and godly desire in your heart. And then, without any of the physical contacts or any relationship, any certificate of marriage or anything happening, you're already married, you're already joined in marriage with that other person. In the spirit, it's the spirit we're talking about. Spiritually, you're married. And as far as God can see, you're already married. We see in other scriptures, I'm not trying to read too much into this, but you'll see later on in other scriptures, even in the New Testament, when Jesus is talking about it, that this is true, it is the spirit that we're talking about, not, not just the physical act. Now, this is exactly why 
Apostle Paul writes to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28, we read, Even so husbands also ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. So if you love your wife, you love your own body, yourself. Love your wife as your own body. You treat your wife as if she is your body. I hope you understand that. There is a massive difference between loving your neighbor as yourself and loving your wife as your own body. The parallel to that is the body of Christ, which is the church. Well, I hope you enjoyed this message. If you have any questions or suggestions, please don't hesitate to let us know, either by email or by commenting. Remember, this video is part of a series, so make sure you watch for the other videos. God bless you.